Welcome one and all to Friday here at the Damage Report. I'm John Adarola and that voice that you may or may have not heard talking before is Brett Ehrlich who joins us now. Brett, and if you, if you want to blame anyone for the look of the Damage Report looking a little different, blame me, I designed it. <laughs> and you know what? It's only going to last for a month. You guys have questions, I got answers. Mm -hmm. It's going to last for a month. We're trying it to try to spread the word of the damage report so people can see it. So people on Facebook have a better time, a, a more pleasurable viewing experience. And we adjust what we're doing here in the live show based on your feedback. So any bit of vitriol you might feel horrible about, just add like a kappa at the end and, and okay. just let us have it. Uh, I we'll, had we'll no idea that you were going to be talking about this as soon as we started the show. If you're on the podcast, you have no idea what we're talking about, <laughs> but we've reformatted uh, some of the shots or whatever. Look, I will say, I think the new lower bar looks very good, very streamlined, minimalistic. God, I like it. Uh, and I think there's some good things, but we're going to continue to uh, evolve. I will say there was one of the funniest comments I've ever read before was someone who left a comment yesterday, I think on YouTube chat that just said, why are the graphics people doing this to us? It's not them. That's what I want. I don't want anyone to blame Skip, Mark, Craig, Jesus. I don't no. want you to blame Norma. I don't want you to blame Carlos. I don't want you to blame Tim. I want you to blame me. Blame yes, me. For everything. And Blame Brett. And, and I, something that I think people can identify with, and it, it's, it shouldn't be that bad. This is called the, the, the split screen. We do use it still, um, mm -hmm. but it is just an attempt to solve a puzzle that makes it so more people can yeah. enjoy the damage report. That's what yeah, all we're trying to do and 100%. not ruin it for anyone. So yeah. um, there's some cool shots that people have kind of helped identify. So the ones that actually look better than the basic ones, yeah. Those are the ones that people helped on, the people I listed before who were yes, like, they did. so they contributed good things. They did, no, and, and Norma is not just tormenting you. That's Though she that. likes to torment me personally, but yes, she's really good me. at it. So I think everybody would be entertained by those backs and forths. 100%. Anyway, uh, either way, the commentary is gonna be the same. And uh, for those of you again on the podcast, apologies. We'll be talking politics soon, because there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, we've now got this uh, near historic strike in Hollywood that we're gonna be talking about slash participating participating in. Also, the defense bill that needs to be passed every year to give you know our armed forces, our service members a raise, uh, suddenly has become just the latest battlefield for the culture wars. So we're gonna be talking about that. Donald Trump facing new challenges legally, a trifecta of challenges that could all coalesce into one big monster over the next few, uh, uh, few weeks. And uh, more bad news for Ron DeSantis, you know, it couldn't happen to a worse guy, so we'll be talking about that. That's all in the first hour. Coming up in the aftermath, we not only will be throwing away our garbage people of the week, and at some point I'll remember that I need to have trashy. Uh, we're also gonna be talking about a trend, I guess, on TikTok that I have become utterly obsessed with. It makes no sense, it might destroy your brain, but it's like all I can think about the last couple days. So uh, tune into the aftermath for that. If you are listening on the podcast, you can go to the YouTube page. Those extra clips go up every day. Uh, with that said, oh, also a reminder, we haven't had Brett on since then. Brett, like me, like the damage report, is now a threader threading up a storm so you can follow us on threads. And the cool thing about that is that then you don't necessarily have to watch us all the time on Twitter because I'm not gonna be there because it's the worst. So anyway. I'm doing better, freer things on threads. Yes, it's just, it's a better place. It's not a perfect place, how could it be? We're still in the real world, which is awful, but it's a better place. Anyway, no, it's not the grimace shake trend, maybe somebody, Nobody is gonna guess which trend I'm talking about. I think it's too new, too niche, too weird, too utterly inappropriate to discuss on a political news show, but we're gonna do it anyway. Along the way, please hit the like button, share the stream so the people know we're live, they can join in on the conversation. And if you wanna send us any comments, tweets, super chats, anything like that, you can do so and we'll respond as we go. But with all that said, Brett, are you ready to start the show? Whether I am or not, you've been more than fair. <laughs> Let's jump into it. How they plead poverty, that they're losing money left and right when giving hundreds of millions of dollars to their CEOs. 
It is disgusting. Shame on them. They stand on the wrong side of history at this very moment because at some point the jig is up. You cannot keep being dwindled and marginalized and disrespected and dishonored. The entire business model has been changed by streaming, digital, AI. This is a moment of history that is a moment of truth. If we don't stand tall right now, we are all going to be in trouble. We are all going to be in jeopardy of being replaced by machines. That is uh, Fran Drescher, obviously a leader of uh, the now striking uh, actors, 160,000 actors joining the already ongoing WGA strike. This is a historic thing and we're gonna be breaking down all the facts. But I really liked what Fran Drescher had to say there. Uh, Fran Drescher has received a lot of public uh, criticism from those she represents in the union uh, for tactics and strategy communication, but also some sort of needless own goals like when she was in Italy just a few days ago and was in a photo with Kim Kardashian or something like that. Wasn't considered to be the best move, I guess the best use of her time. Um, I'm not gonna name names, but I know people, I've actually seen some of the like live negotiations behind the scenes and there's a lot of criticism for Fran Drescher. That said, I think her speech, which you only saw a portion of there, was quite good, pointing out the frustration that she has with these studios, which obviously the studios have a lot of money, the CEOs, as we'll go over, are making a lot of money. So uh, now that we know that this is going to be writers and actors striking together, you want the leadership to come out swinging. And I think Fran Drescher did a pretty good job there. All of those other criticisms notwithstanding. Brett, what do you think? Yeah. Um, when it counts, I'd like to say she did the right thing. Um, and it was weird the timing of when she was like hanging out with Kim Kardashian or whatever that was because it was on the eve of what people knew to be a very key moment. And to be honest, if you're an actor, then the entire existence of reality television, which you know really the Kardashians are the apotheosis of, um, that is invented. For a lot of the same reasons that streaming is is seized upon by the studios, it is they always looking for cheaper, easier ways to make content, where the folks at the top get all the money, and they don't have to pay pretty much anyone else. And if they had it their way, that's how it would be. And what's frustrating is they pretend that like, oh my God, my hands are tied here. You got Bob Iger, you got people at very high levels of these studios saying it's really difficult for us, but they sure as hell ain't living that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, we'll, we'll see, you know, is she gonna continue this sort of thing? You know, if, if it takes weeks, if it takes months, is she gonna continue to be a strong leader? Can she perhaps rewin the respect of some of the rank and file of the the union, which remember, like they're some of the most famous people in the world are part of this union, but tens of thousands of people who are working actors you might never have heard of are also there in far worse economic situations, and I think rightly have been really critis critical of her. Um, that said, why don't we move into what's happening right now? Uh, SAG-AFTRA is now joining the WGA in this historic Hollywood strike. Uh, began at midnight, the first time in 63 years that Hollywood has two unions on strike simultaneously. Meaning that the vast majority of the work that would normally be done uh, beyond just what might be obvious is now for the time being not going to be happening. Um, it would have been great by the way to have the directors involved with this too, but unfortunately that's not the way it shook out. Still. Hard for directors to get a lot of work done without the cast or the writers, I suppose. Now, I wanna give you some more information. The SAG AFTRA 160,000 members, and so that's obviously very significant. For all of you out there, what does that mean in the short term? I find it very interesting when obviously, like if TV is not being produced, movies are not being produced, that's a lot of projects. I always find it fascinating which ones like the New York Times will focus on, I guess, to get people to care about this. And the ones in this case they chose to focus on, this is in the BBC, the Avatar and Gladiator sequels. 
I didn't even know that a Gladiator sequel was coming and now I'm deeply worried about what that's gonna look like. But anyway, it's not coming anytime soon. Uh, Deadpool 3, the sequel to Beetlejuice and a film adaptation of Wicked as well as the next seasons of House of the Dragon and Family Guy are the ones that I see commonly being thrown around. Oh, And also thousands of other TV shows and movies will not be happening. But to be clear, it is not just that upcoming shows and movies will not be filmed. You also have the union members not doing promotional work for upcoming projects. So for instance, the like Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling were doing a lot of promo for Barbie, that's that's done. They literally walked out of the film's London premiere mid premiere because the strike was called. So they're not gonna be doing interviews about this. They're not gonna be going on hot ones to answer questions about Oppenheimer or whatever, all of that. I don't know if it's really fair to say that it's free promo, I guess. But the promotional stuff that drives interest in these projects is done. They're not gonna be doing those interviews. They're not gonna be going to awards ceremonies. A lot of this affiliated stuff that the stars and cast do is done. And so all of this together in theory will exact a cost on the Hollywood studios. But what do you make of that? They, they seemed pretty clear in that reporting from Deadline that Oh, these people are gonna be broke, at least the writers are gonna be broke in five months. We don't have to worry about this. Uh, how do you think it's gonna shake out? Uh, I mean, this is war and this is an existential war as everyone is looking around at people like us and thinking to themselves, I don't know if our days are numbered. What they used to have is a monopoly on how you experienced media, right? And how did that shake out? It was like, think of Disney's vault. Disney had stuff in the vault because it cost them money to print a bunch of like Bambi videos. And so they'd have to expend capital in order to distribute essentially what now they just make available on the streaming service. And you used to have to go to, to go buy a DVD, you'd have to go buy a, a something to watch it individually. Um, or you would have to go to a theater at a time to sit there. Um, and then you'd have to, or you'd have to wait two years until it came out on DVD. Mm -hmm. um, and then for television, you used to have to wait until it was on. And the advertise and the studios, the networks, or I guess the networks and the the providers of of the content, like the cable companies, they didn't make money, and the networks themselves didn't make money unless you were in, had your butt in the seat watching at a certain time. And so now that's all gone. And so they know that and they're gonna put the focus on that part of it, but they're not gonna put the focus on how they're still getting a ton of money. Their entire capital is being invested in distribution models that will allow them to continue making money at that clip based on ways that was very lucrative for ESPN back in the day when it was like sports is the only thing I can, you know, you people would pay money for, but they're getting 20 bucks a month from individuals. The ad model goes away and they're pretending that they can't pocket that when they talk about their losses. They are scared, it is terrifying and uh, in, and they're afraid that all of it in the meantime, as has happened multiple times in the past, all your experience is gonna be replaced by you know, um, just a different form of media that fills the amount of time you would have spent being entertained by the conventional forms. Mm -hmm. And so they're gonna fight really hard, but the actors are basically saying we're very good at this. And as much as you wanna say that like looking back 30 years from now at your experience of media, um, you know, right now when I look back 30 years ago, I look at blockbusters and I look at the movies I saw and the TV shows I saw, saw that still stand up to the test of time. Now is it gonna be what? You're gonna go look at like, the videos that make it on your Reddit feed, the tweet videos that you see that are kind of scrolling past, that is culture. And so we are building culture using the best people at it. And those people who create for all of us, when we wanna stop talking about politics, we wanna stop talking about the news, we wanna talk about stuff that makes us feel good, bad. But the most, that's movies, that's television, that's art. And these artists are like, well, if we give that to an entire generation, I know you guys, the Bob Igers of the world, you facilitate that monetarily from the production standpoint and the development standpoint. But looking back, we're the ones whose images they summon, whose words they recite when they think of the best stuff 
that they experienced in their lives besides like their family. It's it's that art and they should be compensated I, for it. I agree. And what it's why I think that, you know, their strategy already was to just replace as much of this as possible with like unscripted reality stuff and it's not that that stuff isn't popular, it's also it's very popular, but it can't replace everything. It's not like how many Love Islands like do you have to watch to have the emotional effect of watching like Succession? Something like it's like these are different sorts UK, of if it's, media. If it's if it's and Love Island UK, like a bunch, but if it's no, Love that, Island Australia, no, it's like if one it's, episode is like eating in air and they really go what it types. But anyway, shut up. Okay, so um, yeah, and look, what's interesting about this is that the strategy was going to be for the Hollywood studios, uh, and it was pretty clear was we bought up a bunch of scripts, knowing that you writers might go on strike. So whatever, go on strike. We already have scripts. Never mind the fact that scripts have to be modified literally as you're filming. But they were pretending they wouldn't have to do that. But you still need actors. Now that doesn't mean that they don't have things to fall back on. They can buy content that was produced in other countries. They are already doing that. They will do more of that. They can run unscripted stuff without people who are part of the union. But it is it is made a lot more difficult by having Again, most of the most famous people in the world opposing you. They're the people that people follow on social media. And I also think, I'm gonna just briefly say this. I'm obviously wrong in what I'm going to not suggest, but hypothetically suggest. It's not how it works, it'll never happen. But it is one thing to have with Barbie coming out next week or whatever, as an example. It's one of the big movies of the summer. Margot Robbie, Robbie and Ryan Gosling are not going to be doing press interviews leading up to it. Would it not be a different thing if Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling were to be like, no one go see Barbie and Killian Murphy or whatever and Florence Pugh and Matt Damon are like, don't see Oppenheimer. And all the people with the big Netflix shows were like, stop watching my show on Netflix until this is resolved. Like that's not a thing that we've seen and I'm assuming that Actors would be utterly terrified of never getting a role again were they to do that. But you can go way farther than just not producing new content. You can try to use the close you know, social relationship that you have with millions of fans to be like, I need your support and your support is not watching this stuff. Yeah. Um, we're not gonna see that, it's not gonna happen. If nobody would cast Margot Robbie again in a movie, I suppose. but. But they could if they wanted to play hardball, if they really did believe that this was an existential threat to the industry coming in a number of different forms, and I believe that it is, then that is a thing that they could do. Along the way, by the way, these writers who the Hollywood studios are admitting, they think they are so poorly paid that in like four or five months, they're gonna literally be on the streets. It's such an admission of how poorly they're paying them. Robert Reich is reminding people online of how much the CEOs are making in these companies, and it is a lot of money. Netflix is 51 million, Warner Brothers Discovery 39, Paramount 32, AMC 24, Fox Corp 22. Uh, these are people who are making a nice living for themselves. And so far as I know, aren't writing any of the best sections of Stranger Things and their performances where they exist are not drawing people to watch these movies. They are about as tangential to the artistic work that's being produced as is imaginable and they are the ones benefiting the most. Anyway, we're gonna turn to one other quick section of this super fast comment, Brett. Uh, no, go for okay. it. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate your restraint. Okay, one of the other concerns that's been raised in the now writer and actor strikes is what is gonna happen with AI. Now we already know from the point of view of writers, they already believe that the way they're treated by the major studios is horrific. It's way worse than it used to be. The money isn't there, the residuals aren't there. They're not paid for as long of a run as they used to be. And they're worried that in the future, the studios are gonna try to replace them utterly with ChatGPT, which is definitely what the studios would like to do. But it goes beyond just that. The actors are also very worried about this. And part of this came up during the final days of negotiations before this joint strike began. So we have a talk of, this is from the studios, by the way. 
groundbreaking AI proposal that protects actors digital likeness. So they're saying, we tried to give you so much, we're gonna protect your digital license. So we don't know the entirety of whatever that is that they're referring to, but we do know one component of it and it is wild. So according to the executive director of SAG-AFTRA, one of their AI proposals was from the studios. They proposed that our background actors should be able to be scanned, get paid for one day's pay, maybe two, three, four hundred dollars. And the company should own that scan, their image, their likeness, and be able to use it for the rest of eternity in any project they want with no consent and no compensation. So the idea of being able to be like an extra or a featured extra, one of those like first like rungs on the ladder of becoming an actor, they're going to pay 300 people to scan their likeness. It'll cost them a couple ten thousand dollars, and then they will be able to digitally put in extras for the rest of time. Once those extras have died decades from now, they'll still be appearing in the background of scenes. And that's just for the extras, they clearly wanna do this more in movies. And sometimes it's okay, sometimes there's consent. Harrison Ford was perfectly happy, I guess, to be de-aged and have his face mapped onto a younger, younger actor for parts of Dial of Destiny. But they would love to replace people with digital likenesses. Eventually, I think it's gonna go way beyond this. Why hire an actor when you can just make an actor? from the ground up and put them in different movies and AI generate their social presence and AI generate their interviews and wholly own it as a corporate thing. They should be terrified, the people in the union. Brett, what do you make of it? I mean, I've met some of the people who are those like perma extras in, they're just come up there. And here's something that Michael Caine said when he was just waiting around all day to act. He's like, you don't, I act for free, you pay me to wait. You pay me to sit in my trailer and wait. And for a lot of these extras, like that is their living. And they are they are essential or they wouldn't have to be used. They're trying to find a way to use them without paying them. And it is it is a very real way of life. And these are people that you would actually recognize. Like I was on set on a commercial with with a bunch of them and they were like, yeah. And they make, you know, they at the, in 2010, they were making $115,000 a year just being extras. Just being the person who's like in the background going like yeah. looking around and stuff. Um, this is so clearly the worst thing, the worst instincts of Hollywood. And it's just to replace people that they need. And and we all know it's better. John aside, think of the difference between, you know, the, the clone attack of the clones and like the, you know, the actual <laughs> series. When they tried to replace it with digital actors, fully digital everything, it just is weird. And it will get better and better, but at that point, wouldn't you rather have a human being? Because we're trying to convey human emotion, and and cartoon. We just it's you'll never get as authentic as the real thing. Yeah. And what's sad is, given the the direction, and specifically tech and entertainment become one, it's ruining entertainment. Because it's all about scalability, it's all about the industry multiples, it's all about like the proprietary technological products that you create, and then you license those out and you own those. They're trying to apply all those principles to something that is as yeah. old as human beings, which is like art and emotion, and trying to capture that. And it is a skill. It is something that you know, you know, behind me is a digital fire. And I, and there's part of you that on a fundamental level is actually right now feeling like you're by a fire, but it's not a real fire. It should be. In fact, the television the is demand. television itself is a technological extension of the hearth we all used to gather around, but it's not the real thing. It and and I, it's just better when it's around a real thing. And I hate to sound like the guy who's like, oh my god, let's turn off electricity and go back to like gas lamps, but. But yeah. it's you got to know in your heart that it's better to have human beings, and it's just it's just a nicer life to live. Yeah, to, have to know that the person who's providing this art that's such a central part of your experience and development is is a person who's getting compensated for it. Exactly. 
Yeah, I know some people might think that this is just, you know, like this is a grandpa, you know, grandpa John, grandpa Brett, grandpa 160,000 people in SAG AFTRA who don't want things to change, but we get to decide how much change. Do we want a totally soulless, divorce from reality, you know, like genesis of all of the art that we consume, or are there things that are worth being maintained? And with that, we're gonna go to our first break. Lots to talk about when we come back. uh, The defense bill has been passed by the House. The defense bill that's really about anything but. We'll have the breakdown on that and more after this. Okay, I think in lieu of all the politics stuff, we're just gonna talk about TV and movies, I think. From here on out. How often do you shower, John? Do you shower twice a day? Do you shower in the morning or at night? In the morning? Why? What is going on? In it's the been morning. hot, so I've been showering at night, That's and then in the morning, I'm like, do I need to. to? If you need to, you need to. You're wearing a sweatshirt, buddy. It's hot in LA, and you're wearing a sweatshirt, and you're weirded out by the fact that you're hot. Because these no. problems are solvable. No, it's like a. Anyway, I would love to talk about the defense bill, so I'm gonna yeah, do that. Let's do that. We'll see if we can come together around that. We're going to be starting off with some utter nonsense, though, because that's much of what the debate was, starting with this. Well, Mr. Chairman, though, that was unbelievably inspiring. My amendment has nothing to do with whether or not colored people or black people or anybody can serve, okay? It has nothing to do with color Mr. Your Speaker. skin, your, any of that stuff. I'd like to be recognized to have the words colored people stricken uh, from the record. I find it offensive. And very inappropriate. Can I amend my comments to people of color? The gentleman wishes to amend his comments. Is the gentleman asking? Is the gentleman asking? I ask consent. Mr. Speaker, to have the word stricken. I didn't ask for an amendment. Is there unanimous consent to have the have the word stricken? Yes. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, so ordered. I think those words should be stricken. I think that Representative Eli Crane should be stricken. I think that we should not have to deal with this sort of thing on a daily basis, but we do. What was being discussed in that clip, by the way, and it might not be clear because none of the Republicans wanted to talk about this, is the defense bill that needs to be passed. One of the big components of which is giving a raise to members of the armed forces. Instead, like, cause you might be thinking, why are you focusing on this part of it? Why have you plucked out this one weirdo dude, you like, who's not even one of the older Republicans in the House, which would not be an excuse, but he's a younger guy, and he seems to have woken up. He thinks in the 1930s. I'm not sure. It's because that was what the debate was like. It was a bunch of weirdo creeps and racists. And homophobes as well, trying to make what generally is a fairly standard bipartisan thing that briefly recognizes that if we are going to be spending money on the military, maybe it should go to the actual people serving rather than just to like Northrop Grumman or whatever. And instead turned it into a place for them to make little clips for social media, attacking diversity training, abortion, any gender ideology or whatever. He's basically frustrated that anything in the Defense Department would consider race or gender, religion, political affiliations, anything when it comes to training, education, promotion, all of that. He goes on to say, the military was never intended to be, you know, inclusive. Its strength is not its diversity, its strength is its standards. Brett, it's 2023. That that ju- that video just happened yesterday, actually. I love this guy because you. Are, I wonder if you're crazy thinking that there's people like this walking around that are really like thinking this stuff in the Republican Party, and he just proves it. Like I am not about judging people based on their appearance as long as that appearance is involuntary. But once this guy starts throwing that mock turtleneck on under his jacket, he is inviting us to mock him. And I now have full license to do so after he said that. Like my guy, if you said those two words in a row first and then we're like, I mean people of color. Then we understand kind of what happened, though we still know you're kind of choking back 
the racist stuff you normally say the minute you pull your like mock turtle dicky off and reveal like your you know you know ribbed t-shirt you know tank top underneath like we get it um but this is this is just one of those moments where you also see like the dude who's like the acting speaker going like uh permission to teleport myself anywhere else besides here right now <laughs> Granted, okay, thank you, gavel, Permission and then he just disappears. Not go viral. I would just he, really prefer not to. Um, yeah, I just I hate it. Joyce Beatty, Representative Joyce Beatty, had a great response to it and didn't allow him to just like scurry out from the situation he'd put him in. He'd put himself in, I should say. Um, but yeah, it's just that's this. This is what we have. This is what the now governing majority in the House is like, but not just like that, uh, because as I alluded to, they really. They're very impressed with themselves and they very much want to make these little viral moments that absolute troglodytes on the internet will love to consume. I have another example of that. I want to go to Representative Anna Paulina Luna. Take a look at this. Chairman, I couldn't help but um, pull out my pocket constitution and I couldn't seem to find anywhere in here where it says we need to fund programs for humanitarian aid for women and children in Afghanistan. So with that, I just wanted to point that out and I yield my time. You, I mean, you're you're probably not going to find references to that in the Constitution, both because the Constitution uh, doesn't work like that, and also Afghanistan wouldn't be constituted as a country for 150 years. So there's a couple reasons that you probably didn't find that, and I don't even think you were really reading it. I think you see it as a prop rather than something to actually read, let alone be guided by. But that's not how anything works. Or what? Are, is the game that we're supposed to play now, Brett, that we're supposed to go through a bunch of the stuff that she wants funding for and we're supposed to point out that that stuff obviously isn't in the Constitution either and that that's never how the government has ever functioned? And why in particular, out of all of the things that are spent in the nearly trillion dollar defense budget, of things for her to be frustrated by, the idea that some aid might go to women in Afghanistan who are being brutally repressed right now, that's the thing that she felt she needed to stand up and snarkily joke about. They're so stupid. It is so it's so dumb. Fine. All right, then every if it's if the we can't do it unless it's in the constitution. First of all, the framework for passing the laws like that are in the Constitution. You heard of the Monroe, you know, the Monroe Doctrine. There's a guy who wrote the damn thing who was like, "We own this hemisphere." Like that, <laughs> the the DNA of that is from the founders. Like American imperialism built into that model. Um, and then, like, fine. Then every law needs to be a constitutional amendment. So you need two thirds of, of everyone to vote for it. Okay, but that's what's so, I just wanna meet and talk to the people who think that she nailed it. And this other guy, you know, what's Eli his name? Crane. Eli Crane, the military was never intended to be inclusive. You don't, that's not true. That's that you like what you're saying. You just made that up and said it in a way that sounds like it's been around for a long time, but that's, that's not true. If your reading of the Second Amendment that the militia is a bunch of people out there, that our military is the militia of just random dudes and people out there, then yeah. it was designed to be inclusive. It's just it's so of the rushing. people. You know, there is no evidence that inclusivity makes us weaker. You know what makes us weaker? You know what makes recruiting lower? As John said, not paying these people as much as they should be paid. Having you pay them so little that they also rely on other forms of government assistance to get by. Meanwhile, yeah. chucking trillions of dollars at defense contractor CEOs so they can design like, I don't know, a polka dot shrapnel versus like another shrapnel that used to have stripes on it. Yeah. The, the distinction without a difference military that they keep developing and innovating on for no reason whatsoever. 100%. Um, I, I thought that I had come up with something clever, by the way. Um, I was gonna be like, oh, like, uh, we have to stop the billions and subsidies to oil companies, but it turns out that is in the Constitution. So, oh well, I guess we'll continue it.
Anyway, um, yeah. Also, I just imagine like every one of these people, hardcore Christian. I just imagine like Anna Paulina Luna does her little thing with the Constitution. So I just wanted to point that out. I yield my time, and I just imagine Jesus like slow clapping in back of her. Yeah, screw those <laughs> Afghan women. Come on, oh, I hate these people. Anyway. It passed, the bill passed with all of their insane amendments. Uh, Kevin McCarthy originally was gonna stop them from making these um, uh, amendments. And he in theory could do that because uh, technically he's in charge, but he's not actually. He will do whatever they say he should do. So he opened it up to these amendments and uh, they passed it with a whole bunch of nonsense. So they're going to be undoing a Pentagon policy that provides time off and travel reimbursement. This is graphic six to service members who must travel out of state to obtain an abortion. That was added after uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, from their point of view, screw you know people in the armed forces who can get pregnant. Uh, eliminating all diversity, equity, and inclusion offices at the Pentagon. Barring the Pentagon's education arm from buying any book that contains pornographic material or espouses radical gender ideology, which uh, they define for themselves, absent any connection whatsoever to academia as anything that acknowledges that people other than straight cis people exist. Um, prohibiting the Defense Department schools from teaching that the United States or its founding documents are racist, which of course has never happened. Nobody has ever done that. But if you acknowledge anything that was racist that has ever been done, they will say that that is you teaching that it's inherently racist. So we have to strip history from all of its facts, from reality to comply. It's just, it's misogyny, it's homophobia, it's stopping CRT, it's, it's now. It's just another front for their culture war because that is all they have. So whatever is being discussed, whether it's the border or the climate or defense, now needs to become another opportunity for us to talk as if we're fighting against Disney or M&Ms or Bud Light or something. It's all the same thing. It's all utter nonsense. So these are anti-Christian Republicans. In my reading of the weird jellyfish procreation version of the Bible. So in the Bible, Adam is a jellyfish because God took his rib, which is how jellyfish reproduce. They're just like a part of them flies off and becomes another jellyfish. That is a strange gender identity. That is an unorthodox gender identity that's the heart of the Bible. Adam is a freaking jellyfish or a rose bush or a <laughs> grapevine. That is they're not a human, how I know humans. and so. Any mention of the Bible is espousing definitely a weird gender identity if you can make a woman out of a man. But also guys, the pornography, there's a lot of weird stuff in the Bible where people do all kinds of crazy stuff and it's like fine. There's also abortion in the Bible where they're like, let's poison the ladies if you think they cheated on you and then you'll kill the baby. That's the, that's the objective in the Bible. So these folks are so anti-Christian and I'm boiling it down to these, this very fundamental principle. Republicans only have conversations they think they can win. And it is our job to do two things. One, look at their stupid conversations and change them. So when they say, listen, we want the gender identity thing, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, kids sports, you say, okay, great. Where are we funding these genital inspectors? Where are we funding them? Where's the money that goes to pulling up kids skirts in the Republican led initiative to look at children's genitals? Go for it. I'm crazy, you're crazy, you're an insane person. And then yeah, we just need to dismiss them altogether if they're that stupid and point out how ridiculous they are. That's, those are the two, two prongs of it. I like that as a strategy and they actually wanna fund that. Okay, everybody, we're gonna take our second break. When we come back, Donald Trump under the gun, a bunch of different investigations all seeming to coalesce into what could be a very bad August for him. We'll break that down in more after this. Okay, everyone just joining us now, please hit the like button if you're on a platform where that makes any sense whatsoever. And with that, let's jump into this. We make the argument that it fits like a glove, what Trump did related to the speech that he gave on the mall. You can tell this story in terms of 
Trump summoning the people to Washington, and then his conduct during the day, leaving out the specific words he used on the mall. But the, the tweet that he sent out that had to do with Pence's and doing his job and then sitting there for 187 minutes uh, and doing nothing and, and really lending support, he participated in an insurrection. So does the special counsel, Jack Smith, have what it takes and the evidence to prove that Donald Trump actively participated in an insurrection? Well, that guy seems to think that he does. That is the former deputy attorney general under President George H.W. Bush, Donald Ayer, who says that the evidence is there, the speeches are there, the plot in the background is there, the links to Mike Pence, the communications on the day, there's a lot of evidence there. And in terms of being able to prove that he knew that this was illegitimate, you have to be able to show that he knew that he had lost. And we know that that's out there. He referenced that too, saying he said it to a bunch of people. He may have said it to his family members. And so he knew he had lost and he went ahead and he did these things. So at the end of the day, it is of course not gonna come down to dialed air or any former deputy attorney generals or anything like that. It's going to come down to will the special counsel pursue charges specifically related to January 6th to the insurrection. And if he does, what form might they come in and how strong is the evidence? While Donald Trump is facing multiple different sets of charges having to do with the fraud, having to do with E. Jean Carroll and obviously very notably the classified documents. All of that is super significant. The classified documents do have to do with national security, so they are serious too. But what is coming you know, over the next month or so, maybe even sooner when it comes to uh, uh, Fulton County, which we'll be talking about. I do think that these are more important charges. It is, I think, harder for reasonable people to just you know, cast these aside and think that ah, it's documents, everybody does it. The things that he's going to apparently face indictments over over the next month are not things that everyone has done. Joe Biden hasn't done them, Mike Pence arguably hasn't done them, they're serious concerns. And so with that, we're gonna move on to other aspects of this, including a front in this that I had not really been familiar with prior to this week, and that has to do with Arizona. So that is one of the states where the so-called fake electors scheme was being worked on. And apparently the Attorney General of Arizona, Chris May, uh, is investigating the transmission of an alternative slate of electors, which is the terminology that is used by the right. It doesn't mean anything. There are no alternative slates. It's just a thing that they wrote down. There's no mechanism for that. So just to be clear, it was uh, entirely fraudulent from the very beginning intentionally. So. Um, but anyway, Chris Mays, the Attorney General says, we have to make sure that it's clear to everyone it's unacceptable to try to steal an election, to undermine and overthrow an election, and that's what happened. We have to make sure what happened in 2020 uh, never happens again. Um, back uh, at the time, John Eastman, one of the legal advisors to Donald Trump, uh, was involved in this fake elector scheme and wrote in a memo. Uh, at the end, he, Mike Pence, announces that because of the ongoing disputes in the seven states, there are no electors that can be deemed validly appointed in those states. There are at this point 232 votes for the Electoral College for Trump, 222 for, Vi for Biden. Pence then gavels, President Trump is reelected. So the plan, we already know the people that were involved in the different states, and we know from the very top level what the idea was. We pretend that there's ambiguity when ambiguity does not exist. We have Mike Pence do something that he has no constitutional nor legal authority to do, to just say, eh, what are you gonna do? I guess we'll just go with whoever was winning at this point, which is Trump, Trump's president. That's not how any of this works, but that's what they were pursuing. Brett, are you interested in this part of the story? I'm interested in all parts of the story, John. The same level of interest I had in them when they started, and they don't seem tangibly different now, in my opinion. I just, this is the kind well, of thing that will keep- this investigation in Arizona is developing. I had not known that that was something that was being worked on prior to this week. But they, okay, here we go. In the In my opinion, in the mind of the average human being who lives in America, there's a bunch of stuff Trump did wrong. I, as a voter, have an opinion on that already that is not going to change. And that opinion is either I love him and I want him to bear my children or whatever, or I hate the guy, he shouldn't be president anymore. 
or you're just like this person in the middle who either is like, I like the tax cuts or I don't. And you're just like, ugh, he's too much of a headache. It is my contention that these investigations can and will and should proceed in ways that that will probably get as far as they can go, none of which really preclude him from being able to run for president again. The sad fact of like how we should be perceived or perceive ourselves as an America should probably stop short of stopping this dude from being able to run for president again. He, yeah. he should probably try and all this should just be kind of out there. It's a crappy position we're in. Donald Trump is solely responsible for it. His conspirators, his co-conspirators are the rest of the party party elites, the rest of like the party grab ons to his coattails and the media organizations whose whole yeah. charter is just to make money off of it. Yeah, 100%. Uh, also bear in mind, um, I know that a lot of these have been going on for a really long time. But for some of this, uh, it does not appear that we're gonna have to wait very long. When it comes to the attempt to overthrow the election in Georgia, the Fulton County investigation, uh, they have impaneled the grand jury and it is expected that indictments, if they are to come, will come at some point between July 31st and the second or third week of August. So we are talking about the next month, basically. Some of the most significant indictments, again, state level indictments, Theoretically, that he cannot simply make evaporate when he becomes president again. So bear that in mind as we go forward. And with that said, we're gonna end of the hour with one more story. More bad news for Ron DeSantis, a guy who really didn't need it. Tough economic times for people in Florida, particularly when it comes to the cost of insurance. Home insurance premiums in Florida have apparently risen by more than 200% in the just little, little over five years that he has been governor. So on average, Florida homeowners pay over $4,200 per year for home insurance, triple the national average of 1700. And they have been going up ever since he became governor, 206% overall, 42% in just the last year. And it is likely that that is going to get worse because not only are the conditions there getting bad when it comes to extreme weather events and hurricanes and the sorts of things that drive up premiums anyway, but the competition is also going down because whole insurance companies are just entirely pulling out of the state. Farmers insurance became the latest, they're done. They're gonna discontinue new coverage of auto, home and umbrella policies. That's gonna affect 100,000 policies and so with Fewer and fewer remaining insurance companies. In theory, the price could go up. We don't know how many more might pull out, but that is thousands of additional dollars having to be spent on average on a yearly basis. And what is Ron DeSantis doing? What is he doing to keep those prices down? What is he doing to draw in insurance companies? What is he doing to acknowledge that the, the external factors that are driving up the cost like climate change are real and they're not simply gonna cure themselves? What do you think, Brett? Uh, this is the single biggest in this is this is the first time I've really thought to myself, oh, there's a way to get people to care about climate change. Uh huh. Because all of this is a lot of this is based on the risk of like worse and worse storms, uh, rising uh, sea levels, and. You don't, and, and a lot of the time it's like, you know, you think I'm fake, you think the news is fake, you think everyone else is fake. You know who's not fake? Actuaries. <laughs> People who sit there and go, what is the risk potential and how much should I charge so that I don't lose money? Those people. And, well, got, so and, and everywhere they, the Republicans move in this situation, they lose because they're like, oh, what am I backing insurance companies now? What am I gonna say, change to a, a, a more government run way of compensating people for the crap that happens to them? That's not their fault, that's the result of climate change? No, they can't do that because that's big government. So there you go, they're screwed, they're, tra they're trapped. And we need to use this to get the, um, the actual solutions to the climate crisis problems that we face. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, they're, you know they're going to talk about like keeping like you know, taxes low or whatever, but thousands of dollars just poof, evacu evap evaporating. You don't get that back if you know if a hurricane doesn't hit your house. Like you can love De DeSantis and you could hate woke or whatever, but you're going to notice the drain on your bank account. This is hitting a lot of conservatives and it's hitting them hard. And that's why also, per capita more people are moving to California from Florida than are moving to Florida from California. Eat it, Ronnie. Thank you, Gavin Newsom. 
Also, super fast. I just saw that Dylan Mulvaney's approval rating is higher right now nationally than Ron DeSantis. I just think <laughs> that that's the most fun stat ever. We'll see you in the aftermath. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.